Hi, I'm Aishwarya. Hi, I'm Shashank. We work at the Center for Communication Governance at National Law University Delhi and we're very excited to bring you the first episode of the CCG Tech podcast. Why we're doing this podcast is because we wanted to start using some new tools to communicate with experts and find new ways to talk about some of the work that we do here at CCG. A lot of us at the center um, really enjoy listening to podcasts and get a lot of information, uh, both related to our work and not from it. Uh, and so we're really excited to be able to uh, to start our own as well. In the podcast, we'll be speaking to academics, policy professionals, researchers, lawyers, technologists, folks from governments, others in the space on various things that they're working on and things that we're working on that relate to tech policy. Great. Thanks, Ashwarya. Um, I think at CCG, we keep trying to find new ways to share our work uh, with our audience and people who are interested in our work. And this is one um, try at doing that. So welcome, everyone. Great, Ashwarya. So what are we discussing in this first episode in our podcast series? So in the first episode, we're talking about something that we've all been speaking about now for uh, the last few years, and especially more recently, which is how we should regulate social media platforms, which is, I guess, the big question. Uh, This was also something that we covered as part of our summer school this year. And it's also something that's more recently come up on the government's agenda as they start thinking about introducing the Digital India Act, which is supposed to replace the Information Technology Act that we have right now. Um, So during the summer school, we had the opportunity to talk to Dr. Wolfgang Schulz. He's played an integral part of the summer school throughout the editions that we've had it. Um, and he's also been, he's also a great person to talk to about this because uh, he's had a lot of involvement with the creation of the Digital Services Act and the Digital Markets Act in the EU. He's a research director at the Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society and also director of the Liebens Institute for Media Research at Hans Bredow in Hamburg. Just quickly for our listeners and people who are listening in, um, we run an annual summer school where we invite um, scholars, professors, researchers and students for a week long workshop at CCG. Um, um, You know, students and uh, researchers come from uh, Germany and Brazil and uh, we, you know, post pandemic, this was the first time we were conducting the school. So we were very happy to resume it. And um, yeah, that's where, um, as Ashwarya said, we had the opportunity to talk to uh, Professor Schulz. So in this episode, we dive really deep into platform regulation. So we start off with Shashank and I talking about why we're discussing this in the first place. And then we hear what Professor Schultz has to say about a whole bunch of things related to platform regulation. So one on what we can learn from the DSA and the process that went into creating the DSA and the DMA. How we balance multiple laws around the world on platform governance that might say different things. uh, And why tensions between these kinds of laws might not necessarily be a bad thing. Uh, And then we also talk a lot about how we effectively enforce platform regulation laws and the kind of regulatory structures and mechanisms we should use. And then Dr. Schultz ends with uh, with a pretty hard question that we gave him, which is to answer the sort of three key elements that every platform governance law uh, would need to have. So we're talking about platform regulation, right? And I'll just quickly discuss why this conversation is important. Uh, firstly, um, India is thinking about uh, new laws for the internet, um, and uh, it's going to be sort of is in the process of drafting and going to be releasing a new law for the for internet regulation in India, which primarily replaces our existing Information Technology Act. Um, so yeah, I mean, as people who work in tech policy, it's definitely something we should be thinking about. Secondly, I think uh, there's a realization amongst policymakers around the world. Um, that there are certain online harms that kind of can be attributed to plat- internet platforms um, and that current laws are in a way inequipped to deal with these you know, new technologies, new harms that arise with the use of these new technologies. And we now need to build new guardrails for these kind of, to regulate these uh, online platforms. I think lastly, Europe being Europe, they've sort of led the way in some ways. They have thought deeply about uh, internet regulation, how online platforms, for example, um, um, can be regulated, um, how certain um, powerful structures that exist in our digital economy can be sort of regulated. 
and have passed uh, um, a package of laws, including the Digital Services Act that we're going to be referring to as the DSA and the Digital Markets Act that we're going to be referring to as the DMA. Um, and so, yeah, we thought it's a great opportunity to have someone in the room um, and talk to them, um, like Professor Wolfgang, who's also observed the European laws carefully. Yeah, so Professor Wolfia actually is a great person to talk to about this. Uh, first, because I think like we've mentioned before, he's been sort of deeply involved in the process of uh, drafting and formulating both the DSA and the DMA. And also because he has a fair bit of experience thinking about issues relating to free speech and expression. Um, so in this conversation with him, we asked him about basically what he's learned from this process of creating, uh, of the EU creating the DSA. Um, so we asked him about basically what kind of highlights stood out to him from this process and also uh, generally the kind of learnings that we might be able to adapt um, as we think about our own platform regulation. And so here's what he had to say. We are well aware in Europe, I think, that um, it's not just an act for Europe. It will have an um, impact on, on other countries as well. This kind of impact can happen in different ways. And one way is that governments all over the world and obviously in India also are looking for maybe some tools they can use as well. Um, I think this mutual learning between um, the a governance system is uh, something which is helpful because we are dealing with really complex problems. Um, and one of the learnings from, from the EU, at least from my perspective, is um, that it is not so much a political battle, so that we have left-wing parties have a different concept than right-wing parties. There are some, some policies uh, favoring maybe a liberal, light-handed approach and others not, but there's no one denying the, the problems and, and the, the potential the platforms actually have. So it's uh, about... Um, more about um, the right concepts and the knowledge we need uh, to understand um, what these online harms actually are, what the potentials are, how we can uh, mitigate risks and things like that. Um, one idea the um, at an early stage already with the DSA that um, was put, put forward and uh, is in the final draft is um, that we differentiate between different sizes of platforms. That has been controversial at the beginning because a small platform can have an important impact and can cause harm, of course. Um, but um, um, the final thinking was that um, it is a complete difference to deal with the really big players. Um, and uh, so some of the regulation elements in the DSA are just targeted at uh, very large platforms or very large search engines. Um, and uh, when the number of uh, users uh, reaches over 10% of the population of the EU, so that's uh, one of the yardsticks, then it's regarded as a big platform. And then it is dealt with not on a national level in terms of supervision, but the EU Commission. Um, so the can say the European government um, is mainly responsible for, for doing that. In terms of uh, conceptual elements, what I find interesting, and that's something that uh, many acts in the EU now entail, uh, is uh, the risk assessment that these mm -hmm. very large platforms and search engines have to do. Um, that's a good instrument because it's, uh, it's flexible. So when we have new things, Think about the metaverse, for example, a platform, a non-standard platform, uh, which might trigger new risk because it's a, a 3D uh, environment. Um, yeah. And then you can have new forms of harassment um, and you have to address that. And so under this risk assessment obligation, the platforms have to come up with an assessment by themselves. They can be challenged by others. Mm -hmm. um, NGOs can play a part. Uh, I think that is something that is maybe a concept that can be transferred in other cultural contexts because the risk can be different uh, depending on the, the mitigation of risk can be different uh, depending on the social and cultural uh, and economical background. Mm -hmm. um, so that's something I find um, extremely interesting to, to uh, think about. Yeah, I, I should I find that very interesting about the whole risk assessment obligation that the DSA has um, you know, that's that's a novel regulation that the DS is bringing on some large platforms. Um, you know, as we think about uh, the DIA and the internet regulation in India, might be something uh, we want to look at as well, especially as Professor Wolfgang was mentioning that this may be one of the tools to 
contextualize regulation to let's say india's reality and countries can then contextualize to their own realities i think um that's very interesting and uh, i think in the recently concluded uh, public consultation that the uh, minister of state did on the dia i saw that i in, in the slides they did mention risk, risk assessment so something for all of us to think about yeah it also relates to this conversation that i think we've had in many different contexts on tech in different aspects of tech policies it's come up with the data protection act it's coming up with platform transparency rules the kind of tension between local regulations so that it's suitable for local context but also having some kind of like baseline global standard for what these regulations should look like um so this is something that uh, professor shulz has spoken a lot about and so we asked him for his thoughts about it we will not get rid of this tension that we have basically national or in the european context eu level regulation and um, global platforms and there will always be a tension and this tension is not always a bad thing because uh, um, as a freedom of speech uh, scholar um, i would say sometimes the platforms are the problem sometimes the states are the problem and sometimes i appreciate platforms not obeying state laws because uh, they are violating human rights and uh, we do not have an perfect uh, enforcement of human rights uh, to say the least <laughs> in in the international uh, system so um that means that um we will end up with a kind of hybrid system that will not be perfect and um i think these uh, we will end up with um, a system where we have some patterns of platform regulation some countries follow a kind of european model maybe mid uh, um, national or uh, continental adoptions um, um others will follow another model and i think it's important that we have a kind of um um interface or a kind of interoperability between those um and that is something where institutions like unesco come in they are just working on on guidelines they are not binding but nevertheless that might be helpful for all the actors like governments legislators uh, platforms civil society um to um, to deal with that um it will always be i think a problem for small countries um to attract the attention of the um, of the big platforms uh, because they are of course uh, money driven and um, the markets play a role um, but this um, kind of um, uh, adopting uh, partly at least regulation that is already in place in Europe for example and uh, just tweak us a little bit might be a good strategy for for countries i had a conversation a couple of weeks ago with a representative of a communication commission of a smaller asian country mm-hmm. um and she said she has really problems reaching someone at the platform because they don't really talk with her and i think uh, when they form a kind of strategy um then it can be helpful to say europe does it you have already uh, instruments in place we need these or that amendment here and then that would work for our country as well i think this kind of of um uh, efforts are helpful and that would at the end i would say uh, serve the user because um, uh, that's what the european regulator had in mind uh, basically when drafting the dsa so it's it's uh, i think it is fair to say that it is about the um, benefit for the user and mitigating the risk for the user great i think the brussels effect or the eu effect is real i think uh, um countries around the world are going to take inspiration from laws like the dsa and the dma uh, to different degrees of course um, um i know that the indian government um has tried to place itself outside the conversation and say that um listen we need to uh, think about laws from our reality which is i think fair um right but i think another question that comes to mind and which is relevant both for europe and india ashwarya is that we know for example in europe uh, with the gdpr you know their prime data protection law um, that has a great influence on data protection laws around the world uh, that enforcing that law uh, in the eu has been a bit of a challenge for them um uh, i know some part of this is because of the complex legal structure of the european union itself um but uh, it is also due to a certain inertia that there is when it comes to regulations and enforcing them against uh, especially big tech uh, companies 
um um so you know just wanted to throw it back to you uh, and how that's maybe relevant to india as well yeah i mean i guess that's one of the big questions right um like you're saying in the eu so it's like a, an issue with tech platforms in general itself because nobody quite knows yet how really to handle them but also if you do look at india specifically that has historically been one of the biggest issues that we've had is that we have a lot of flaws but again the way that we actually enforce them has not really been consistent um across the laws and across the different provisions so even for example if you look at the it act itself uh so i guess part of it is also that it over the years has just like ended up being sort of the digital law without like really intending to be that so we have data protection provisions of some kind the uh, sensitive personal data rules for example um so it like goes very widely beyond the ambit of just digital commerce which is what it started for and it's been very hard to um, enforce these kind of provisions um effectively and also the other kind of uh, issue is that like again not all the provisions under the act because again it's so broad have been um enforced as efficiently um so i guess the one thing that we really do have to think about is with the regulatory capacity of the eu um if they're having trouble with like a comprehensive law like the gdpr and sort of enforcement is a real issue for them then we really need to think about how we make sure that the laws that we frame can actually be enforced effectively as well We asked Professor Wolfgang actually about his thoughts on this. He has thoughts about how enforcement uh, works under under the DSA, also because they've had some time to learn from the GDPR itself. Yeah. Um, so here's what he had to say. So the um, enforcement concept of the um, DSA is a little bit of a mixed bag when I look at a um, researcher at it. Um, one thing is that um, the EU draw lessons from. GDPR, where we had some before the GDPR, and I would say still now <laughs> have some enforcement issues with mm -hmm. data protection. Mm -hmm. uh, and now for the very big platforms, the main enforcer is the European Commission. Mm -hmm. And that is on the one hand a good thing because they are powerful. The companies listen when the Commission uh, says something. But on the other hand, the Commission is a political body. It's a um, kind of government uh, in Europe. They are um, accountable to the European Parliament. In the European Parliament, there could be a majority, I don't hope that, of extreme parties um, with some interest in, in regulating speech. And um, that is something which is a little bit worrying, I would say. Um, so on the one hand, I understand it. On the other hand, I think independence in this uh, um, aspect is uh, this this field is important and and the odd thing with the DSA is that the national controllers, yeah. um, but the member states of the EU have uh, is uh, um, they have to be completely independent from industry as well as from government bodies, uh, but the European Commission um, in the center of all that. Um, um, I think that's something that worries me a little. Uh, I understand why we are following this kind of trend yeah. in Europe. Um, but that's something where I would say you have to be careful when you are talking about communication regulation, you are talking about uh, um, undertaking surgery in the open heart of democracy. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so um, you have to be very careful what powers you grant uh, mm -hmm. governments. Yeah, so actually one thing that uh, Professor Wolfgang is talking about really stood out, which is that the EC has been given a lot of um, the enforcement power under the DSA. Um, and like uh, Professor Wolfgang was saying, it is also a political body. And so it really becomes then important for us to think about what the role of a regulator will be, the kinds of powers, the kinds of safeguards that you incorporate in any kind of regulatory structure when it comes to digital platforms. Um, so Shashank, how would you think about this for a country like India, for example? Right. Uh, I think it's a very important question to ask ourselves, uh, Ashwarya, as we think about the regulatory framework or the enforcement mechanisms on these laws. Uh, in the recent past, um, you know, if you look at various versions of the Data Protection Bill, uh, we've seen that um, the regulators are heavily appointed by the executive as well here. Uh, and now with the latest draft of the Data Protection Bill, the Digital Personal Data Protection Bill, uh, we see that um, there is a lack of a regulatory body now and we kind of have a quasi-adjudicatory body in the form of the Data Protection Board. Although that's useful, but again, the Data Protection Board is directly appointed by the executive branch of the government here in India. Um, so again, we, we really need to carefully think about 
uh, the effectiveness of uh, um, the enforceability and the enforceability of these regulation uh, when when we think about the regulatory framework and how how we want to place independence and accountability on uh, these frameworks and um, yeah we we got to talk to professor wolfgang about it as well let's get him on so there i think there are a couple of things one is um that you need an institution that has a, a specific element of independence in it, mm -hmm. but at the same time is accountable to someone and yeah. um, basically the society. Mm -hmm. um, that's not an easy task. Um, you have to have transparency regulation for them as well. We are talking yeah. about transparency of platforms, but the transparency there is um, the prerequisite for um, for holding holding institutions accountable. There might even be a good idea to have not only one, but also oversight boards, uh, oversight board that have civil society actors there who could criticize the uh, government regulator and maybe vice versa. So that's one thing, independence and accountability, how to re uh, reach that and how to, how to balance that. The second one is, um, and that's another uh, lesson from Europe, I would say, um, if um, there are some elements of hard regulation, then you need effective sanctions. That's, yeah. um, that's for sure. I very much believe in co-regulation and things like that. And I think many things can be left to uh, the industry to self-regulate. Uh, but the things that are really extremely important for society, the, uh, the regulator needs to have um, um, these um, um, the, um, means of, yeah. of finally um, um, sanctioning um, the companies. And the final thought on that is um, it's a very complex um, environment. Mm. Um, regulator need knowledge. Um, they need knowledge about technology. They need knowledge about the use of the technology because it's some technologies have been invented in a way, but the use is a completely different one. Mm. Yeah, I think uh, that's another great, great question to think about is the capacity of these regulators, right? What sort of knowledge do they already need? What sort of, sort of experience they need to ensure that uh, these complex um, social techno regulations are effectively enforced? Um, great, so Ashwari, how are we closing this episode? <laughs> Well, uh, the last question we had for Professor Wolfgang was basically just what he thought... Uh, the three elements that any kind of platform regulation, regardless of like what country it worked in, how many countries apply to, et cetera, like what that should have. Um, so that wasn't an easy question to answer, but he actually had a very good one for us. So here's what he said. Thanks. That's, of course, a challenging final question, but I'll try it anyway. Um, apart from the things I mentioned already, I would mention the following three, um, three aspects. Um, the first one is um, you have to keep the problem you want to solve for the regulation uh, in mind. Um, and I say that uh, because I've seen very often, I would say, that uh, you start a governance conversation and then it becomes uh, like circling about it itself and you don't lose the track of what problem did we actually want to address. I would say that's even true for some big European regulations that uh, take the AI Act, for example. It's more or less, well, we have to regulate AI, but what specific problem, um, specific technologies or practices have, um, maybe we don't have that always um, sufficiently inside. Um, the second one is, uh, it should be a kind of learning system. Um, the, it's developing so fast um, that... Um, um, uh, one static system cannot function. Um, and that means, for example, that uh, in most countries, because lawmakers are not that fast, um, you need to have some delegated powers of uh, regulators. That has to be limited because uh, of accountability issues and that the final say in a democracy should rest with the parliament. Um, but nevertheless, there has to be some flexibility. And the final one um, is um, human rights centric regulation. I think we should keep in mind um, that it's um, about um, the rights of the users. Uh, we have a human rights framework. We should take that seriously. Um, and um, that means that freedom of speech, access to information, but also other uh, maybe competing human rights have to be taken into account in each and every step of the development of the governance framework.
yeah, we've covered a lot in this conversation. So I think maybe the just biggest takeaway from this is just that we are clearly at an inflection point um, where we have a lot to think about in terms of how we want to um, regulate platforms, which is definitely one part of it, but also just more broadly, the kind of roles that we want them to play in our lives and the kind of safeguards that we want to incorporate to make sure that our rights are protected. Um, so as India thinks about its internet laws and as uh, civil society, academics, the government, everyone sort of like thinks through how we most effectively operationalize it, uh, you can expect a lot more work from us at the center. And so we'll keep you posted. Um, we hope you've enjoyed this conversation and that it's also given you a lot to think about. Uh, thank you so much for listening. We would love to hear your thoughts on the episode and your suggestions on what topics you would like us to cover. You can reach out to us through email or find us on our social media. We will link the details of these in the show notes. Lastly, we would like to thank National Law University Delhi and the Frederick Norman Foundation for Freedom for their support in creating the podcast. If you enjoyed the conversation, please like and subscribe wherever you're listening to the podcast. We look forward to bringing you more content. This podcast was created by Center for Communication Governance at National Law University, Delhi. This episode was edited by Ananya and Gopika.